silicon is the second most common element on Earth, followed by oxygen. It can easily be found in the sand, but as we've learned in our previous videos, it is also used for its conducting properties. In fact, it is the main element of photovoltaic cells, diodes, thyristors, and transistors. The latter, in particular, in the MOSFET version, is the primary component for the realization of the central processing unit, which we all know as the CPU. In this video, we will explain how a CPU is made, how it works, and why it is the basis of every digital electronic device. JAWS, for over a decade, has been providing its customers with the best solutions for their supply chain, and in their catalog, you will find any kind of circuit boards, PLC, PCB, and DCS for industrial control systems. Let's start with the infinitely small. By using sophisticated technologies, silicon is purified and molded into thin layers called wafers. After which, atoms of different elements are added. This operation is called doping. In this way, thanks to the impurities found in the crystal lattice, silicon becomes a semiconductor. Silicon belongs to the 14th group of the periodic table, and every atom has four valence electrons, forming a very regular crystal lattice. If dopant atoms from elements of the 13th group with three valence electrons are added, such as boron or gallium, we obtain a p-type semiconductor and we create a hole in this structure. On the other hand, if elements from the 15th group, like phosphorus or arsenic, are added, which have five valence electrons, an n-type semiconductor is created, and there will be a free electron in the crystal lattice. The MOSFET transistor is composed of a doped silicon wafer, as shown, with one p-type and two n-type semiconductor parts, a layer of silicon oxide, which acts as an insulator, and a conductive layer of polycrystalline silicon. Every transistor has three terminals. The central one is connected to the polycrystalline silicon and is called gate, while the other two are connected to the two parts of the n-type wafers and are called source and drain. The contact area between a p-type semiconductor with an n-type semiconductor is called the depletion region. Within this zone, free electrons from the N layer will fill up the holes in the P layer, where there are no free electrons or holes. When a situation of equilibrium is reached, the depletion zone of the N side becomes positively charged, and the zone of the P side becomes negatively charged. Thanks to this reaction, an electronic field is created which serves as a barrier to prevent further electrons exchange and acts like an insulator. In fact, if we add an electric charge to the two external terminals, electricity cannot flow. However, if we add an electric charge to the gate, we form an electric field, which attracts the free electrons of the p-type layer. In this way, a new n-type area is formed nearby the gate which serves as a communication between source and drain so that the electric current can flow. MOSFET transistor can therefore control the current flow and then switch on and off. This simple operation is the basis of all technology where every switch on or off is interpreted as zero or one. To put it in other words, it is the binary code of our computer systems in fact, each CPU has billions of transistors organized in different ways so as to form the most varied logic gates. Logic gates placed in succession can solve the most difficult computational problems. Moreover, every second the transistors turn on and off at a tremendous speed, measured in gigahertz, that is, billions of times per second, 
This speed is called the clock. And the higher it is, the more powerful is the CPU at the expense of temperatures. Beneath the CPU are placed some pins attached to a motherboard that receive and carry commands to the various components of the computer. The RAM memory, or random access memory, is the component that works most closely with the CPU. Together, they run the fetch, decode, execute cycle. That is the logical functioning of computer processors. It consists of a first phase called fetch, where the CPU collects data from the various RAM addresses through buses, which are then kept in the CPU registers. The CPU stores the instruction temporarily so that it can be decoded and executed. Then we move on to the decode phase, in which the CPU analyzes the data. Finally, in the execute phase, the decoded data are processed in the logic gates of the CPU. At this moment, the new data is transferred back to the RAM and the cycle is completed. Now, process data can transit through the motherboard to the various components of the PC, such as graphics card, solid state memory, USB controller, power management circuits, wireless card, etc. Thanks to the advancement of technology, all these devices are now based on a single silicon chip. Thanks to the system on chip, a system installed on an integrated circuit in which a single chip combines in addition to the central processor, also high chipsets and controllers such as the one for RAM and GPU memory. Nowadays, technology is becoming more and more thin and high performance so that we needed a model to predict its growth rate. For instance, Moore's first law created a way to measure the complexity of a microcircuit. He discovered that the number of transistors per chip doubles every 18 months and therefore quadruples every three years. In this regard, to what extent do you think technology can influence our life in the future? Answer us below in the comments. If you found this video useful, please let us know by leaving a like and a comment. You can also share it. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Don't forget to take a look at our website, jawscompany.com, to find out more about our next projects.